Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we are talking about the next step for the supercharger install which is putting the S2000 on a dyno and making sure that everything is working as it's supposed to. Now the kit, the stage one kit which is what I've installed on this uh, is supposed to be good for 6 psi and it comes with a controller so it controls the air fuel ratio, uh, the timing when VTEC engages, things like that. So ideally you don't have to touch anything after you've installed this kit. It does it all for you uh, but you do really want to put it on a dyno and make sure that you're getting the actual air fuel ratios that you are anticipating you should be getting. So Science of Speed actually provides a uh, chart and they say put it on a dyno and make sure that your air fuel ratio looks something like this and that your fuel pressure looks like that. So basically they want to make sure that your air fuel ratio is floating somewhere between about an 11 and a half to 1 uh, to about 12 to 1 as uh, the ideal ratio there for this kit on this engine. So I took my S2000 to Throttle Works, which is an awesome shop located in Boise. So if you're in the Boise, Idaho area and looking for a great shop, uh, Throttle Works has been awesome to work with. So I put my S2000 on the dyno there to verify our air fuel ratios. And I know the question that everyone is wondering is how much power does this car now make? So we put it on the dyno and at 6 PSI at about 8,800 RPM, it saw an increase of 80 horsepower uh, so about a 40% a little bit more than 40% additional horsepower at the wheels so before putting the supercharger on we were measuring 185 on a Mustang dyno after putting the supercharger on we were measuring about 265 horsepower at the wheels on a Mustang dyno now if you are curious what this would be like on dyno jet numbers they do some tweaking uh, to show the numbers and it's low 300 range so around the 300 horsepower mark uh, if you were to put it on a dyno jet I like using the Mustang dyno numbers I think they're a bit more conservative and a bit more realistic so that's what I am going with uh, previously 185 horsepower plus 80 horsepower is now about 265 horsepower so does that make sense and thinking about it uh, it actually does so if atmospheric pressure is about 15 psi and I am at a little bit higher elevation I'm about 2700 feet uh, here in Idaho uh, but if atmospheric pressure is around 15 psi and we add 6 psi of additional air to that 6 out of 15 is 40 percent so we should see about a 40 percent roughly increase in power and that is what we saw a little bit more than 40 percent uh, 80 additional horsepower at the wheel so very cool to see 265 horsepower but the peak number is not what's super important it's important to look at the curve all right, so looking at the curves for both torque and horsepower before and after installing the supercharger, you can see that power and torque remain about equal until about 3,500 RPM, and then that's where things start to separate. And so by about 4,300 RPM, the supercharger is up about 17 pound-feet in torque, and it's producing about 1 to 2 PSI here in this range. And then PSI just continues to increase and torque continues to increase with it. So just before VTEC, you're looking at a torque increase uh, for the supercharged engine of about 30 pound feet. And the previous engine without the supercharger, peak torque was at about 6,800 RPM, 127 pound feet, versus now peak torque continues to climb all the way to about 8,100 RPM, where it peaks at 163 pound feet. So overall, uh, you know, starting in the 4,300 RPM range up about 17 and then plus about 30 by about 6,000 RPM and then about 45 pound feet uh, by the end of the power and torque curve at around 8,800 RPM. So peak to peak comparisons before and after it's up about 78 horsepower and 36 pound feet. Uh, but in that power band, you know, where the S2000 engine is most happy, which is above 6,000 RPM. So from about 6,000 RPM to 9,000 RPM, it's up about 30 to 45 pound feet of torque, uh, depending on where you're looking at there. And I'll get into why we have that kind of dip in torque at the end, because with these centrifugal style superchargers, you should see a continuous increase in torque as PSI, as your boost pressure continues to increase. 
Okay, so this leads us to a discussion about air fuel ratios. And so this is something that you can adjust on this kit. And so there's a fuel pressure regulator located right here, which you can adjust if you need more or less fuel. And so you wanna measure the air fuel ratio. So at Throttle Works, we put an exhaust sniffer on it uh, to measure the air fuel ratio. Now this is after the catalytic converter. So it's actually gonna measure a little bit higher than if you were to say install a wideband sensor, which is you know a modification that I should be doing very soon on this uh, is putting on a wideband sensor you want that O2 sensor before the catalytic converter because the catalytic converter will change the air fuel ratio so if you want to read the true uh, air fuel ratio you want to measure that close to where the exhaust is coming out before it goes through a catalytic converter now it's totally fine to measure it at the exhaust. I was talking with the shop about this. They say typically they may see about half a point increase. So instead of, you know, it may say 11.5 to one uh, and you know, the actual air fuel ratio may be around 11 to one, uh, but that they see good numbers using this exhaust style method uh, to measure air fuel ratios. So they were confident in it, and so we use this method to measure it since I don't have an additional bung welded in front of the catalytic converter to measure. And so we looked at air fuel ratios and we want to make sure that it kind of lines up with what Science of Speed was aiming at, which was somewhere between 11.5 and 12 to 1 air fuel ratio. Okay, so looking at a graph of the air fuel ratio along with our power and torque, this is where you can start to see, you know, the drawbacks of having uh, this piggyback style ECU and not a standalone ECU where you can have more control and you can kind of smooth out these fluctuations in the air fuel ratio. And so looking at it here, you can see that, you know, above about 4,500 RPM, it does stay in the range that we want it to. So it's floating between about 11 and a half and 12. And then by the time it gets to about uh, 8,400 RPM, 80, maybe 8,200 RPM, it's starting to get super rich and it dives down into the tens. Uh, but you also have a spike earlier on and I believe, and I'm gonna look into this more, but I believe the Science of Speed Kit changes the VTEC engagement from about 6,000 RPM previously to now about 4,400 RPM. So it looks like what's happening is once VTEC engages and it starts to get additional fuel, it doesn't compensate for that perfectly once it gets additional air rather from VTEC opening up. It doesn't compensate perfectly with the fuel. And so you see a little bit of a spike in the air fuel ratio. It's still not going lean, uh, but it is certainly less rich for that moment. And then it has these fluctuations in it, which you know, with a standalone ECU, you could be able to tune out uh, and, and have a much you know, smoother curve like Science of Speed suggests in their paperwork showing you know, what is ideal. So looking at this curve, I think one of the cool things to think about is where is power being left on the table? What's ideal with it? What is not ideal with it? And so looking at that curve again, from about 3000 to 4000 RPM, you can see it falls a little rich. And because it's too rich there, you are gonna be losing a little bit of power as a result of that. So you could increase uh, the low end torque a bit from 3000 to 4000 RPM simply by uh, decreasing that or, or increasing that air fuel ratio. And then you want to get rid of that peak, of course, with the VTEC. It should be a much smoother transition when VTEC engages. And it should be smoother kind of across the board, but honestly, the power and torque probably aren't going to change much as a result of that. It's staying within the safe ideal range. And then there is some power that looks to be left on the table uh, above about, you know, 8,300, 8,200 RPM, above 8,000 RPM when that air fuel ratio really starts to drop and get into the mid to low 10 uh, air fuel ratios. Once it's in those tens, uh, you can see that the power curve kind of starts to, to drop off a little bit with it. So if you were to have an ideal air fuel ratio there for those last thousand RPM, then that would probably help with the power. Now, what's good about this is it shows that these stock injectors so this kit is using stock fuel injectors it shows that they are plenty capable of delivering the amount of fuel required because it's running rich at the highest load the highest boost pressure 6 psi at the highest rpm so 8800 to 9000 rpm where it's hitting that 6 psi it is still able to run very rich so the fuel injectors are plenty capable of keeping up with the fuel demand uh, required for this so that's good to see 
Uh, the problem with it is just that there's a little bit of power left on the table. It's running a bit too rich there uh, in order to optimize the efficiency of the engine. So I think the most important question here is, is it safe to drive? Can I go rip on it on a canyon road? And thankfully the answer to that is yes, because it is, you know, where you have that ideal power band, it is remaining in safe air fuel ratios, kind of in the ideal range that Science of Speed is looking for. Uh, so that's great to see and you know that it can be safe uh, and you're not gonna run into lean situations where there's, there's not enough fuel. So it's good to see that. I think from an optimization standpoint, this is where a standalone ECU would make a lot of sense because you could you know, perfect that curve and help the top end uh, increase in power rather than kind of flatline. And there's a reason why I did it this way. You know, if, if, I, if I wasn't making videos and I had no desire to learn uh, about this, this process, then I would just go straight with the stage two kit. Uh, but I like the process of seeing the individual gains and what is an individual change? Uh, how is that individual change benefiting you, uh, you know, from, from start to finish? So that's why I'm doing this in smaller steps rather than just, you know, let's go for it. Let's just go stage two, put a ton of boost on it uh, and see what happens. Uh, I'd rather do it in steps and kind of learn along the way, you know, what are the strong points? What are the weak points? What can be improved? as this car is slowly modified uh, to being greater. So the good news is the next video, I should be ripping on this thing, uh, having some fun with it, enjoying that new sweet spot from about 6,000 to 9,000 RPM, which this engine was designed for. Uh, that's where it loves to be. And so I'm excited to test that out, enjoy the new power uh, and have some fun in the S2000. So a big thank you to Throttle Works. And of course, thank you all for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave those below.